towards wine. And getting back to acidity, it is, you know, th to me, probably the single biggest component in pairing food and wine. Uh, so if you think about, like I said, cooking and basic chemistry, it's the acid that, with this dish, for example, is the creamy, the, 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 the cream in the, in the, with the pasta, it is, uh, if you want to think somewhat basic, cream, it, cream is a base, right? So the, the acidity, or acid in the wine, combats that, or, or I don't say combats it, but offsets it. So, and this is, when you, when you are pairing food and wines, this is what you're looking for, is that balance. You take the food, it's got, you know, some of the creaminess, you take the wine, it should hopefully be acidic, and they cancel each other out, and then your mouth is clean. This is, again, this is what you're looking for in balance. Acidity, you know, with, uh, so going to the red wine, so a common pairing that a lot of people think of is uh, Cabernet Sauvignon and, and steak. Why does that work? Well, it's, it works, it's very basic. Cabernet, the grape, um, quite literally, some, it's about the size of, maybe a little bit bigger than the top of this bell. Um, as a result, the amount of pulp, to, what they call the pulp to pip ratio, is quite, uh, quite close. So the tannin that's, in, that's on the skins, the acidity in the, in the grapes, is, uh, is quite high relative to other grapes, like Pinot Noir is a rather large grape. That tannin is, uh, let me, actually I should, I should explain tannin. If you think about eating, a, if you uh, take an apple, uh, if you bite into an apple, and you think, uh, apple skin, you get sort of that chalky feeling on the back of your teeth, that's tannin. What, it's on all fruit, it's primarily in the skins, but it's in the seeds and in the stems. When you're making wine, you crush the grapes, and that tannin is leached into the, into the wine. So take a good steak, what the, a, a proper steak, in my estimation, is, has, has a high fat content. Again, the fat being, that's where the, I mean, that's where the flavor comes from, right? So you take a, a bite of the steak, and it's got this fat, and you're chewing it around. Take some of the wine, say a Cabernet. It's got tannin, it's got acid. The, it sounds, it's actually kind of gross if you think about it, but it's really, it's really, <laughs> so, the tannin is actually stripping away all that, the fat that's in that meat. And what you feel, and if you drink a, you know, a tannic wine, even if you take some tea, tea has a lot of tannin in it as well, that, that chalkiness, is, that's actually what your mouth feels like. Like your mouth has been clean, cleansed. Now, the, people think about it, it's it kind of gross, but it's really, really is, and that's what, what makes it work. Um, when I was talking earlier about sugar levels and, and fermenting wine and, t and getting them dry, um, or fermenting all the, not necessarily getting them dry, but fermenting the sugar out, the, uh, the ripeness of a grape is directly, again, uh, related to the environment in which it's grown. Some, something that's it's, it's a bit counterintuitive, you think, well, you, know, you want to grow grapes, you want to, and people have this romantic idea of, say, Tuscany or, or even California, where you're looking for those lush green valleys and you want, you know, nice warm climate. And you, it's actually the, again, counterintuitive. The, it's one of the worst places to grow grapes. The, the, the riper a grape gets, again, the more difficult it is to ferment the wine or from, from, to produce a wine that's actually in balance at table. Again, if you get higher sugar levels. You have to ferment that out. You fully dry. You're going to end up with a wine that's highly alcoholic. When pairing that with food, it becomes very difficult. Um, you're seeing now in California, and have been for some time, Zinfandel is probably the most egregious example, but even now you're seeing with Chardonnays, Cabernets, uh, wines that are routinely getting up into 14, 15, 16 percent alcohol. I've seen uh, Martinelli, as a producer, very popular producer, but they have a, a Zinfandel that's 17.4 percent alcohol by volume. To put that in context, a, a bottle of port is 20% alcohol. And you wouldn't, I, I hope you wouldn't sit down and drink a bottle of port. <laughs> it, but I mean, if you're just trying to imagine, I mean, trying to pair that with food, I mean, number one, you'd be hammered. I mean, it, number two, if the, wine, if the food has any sort of spiciness to it, alcohol, again, being somewhat, I mean, being in that more toward the acid end of the spectrum, and spice, again, being acidic, it's like pouring gasoline on a fire. And it's so a lot of people, you know, Zinfandels are very popular, but you go to, you know, to pair with food, and it's, it's impossible. I think a lot of people don't, don't really consider alcohol when, again, when they're looking at 
looking at, at selecting a wine for, for their meal. Um, price. Uh, this is something that I get, I get into a lot with a lot of my clients, especially if they have newcomers to wine. They look at a bottle on the shelf and they say, well, this is, you know, 50 bucks or 75 bucks, and I guess that should be good. I cannot stress enough that price, is, as I said, never be considered an indication of quality. More often than not, I think, especially with new world producers, it's a reflection of their ego, of their boat payment, of their vacation home. Like, this is what they're paying for these things. If you get into Europe, especially in Burgundy, um, Price is more dictated by just simple economics. There's supply and demand. There's really, Bordeaux, or sorry, Burgundy, if you look on the map, um, it's about 35 miles long. At, the, at its widest spot, it's about five miles wide. That's all there is. The whole world wants it, and so the price, and, you know, it's a supply and demand. There is not, there's very little produced. Everybody wants it, so the price goes up. But generally speaking, again, the vast majority of wine you're gonna see is the, the Pricing is simply this, picked a number out of the air. So this is, happened back in the uh, late 80s, early 90s. Catherine Kennedy is a producer in California. Um, she was the first one to break the century mark. She charged $100, and, and it's kind of a funny story. She, she didn't charge $100 because it cost $100. She charged $100 because her son said, well, they were trying to figure out how to price it. And her son said, well, charge 100 bucks. See if anybody buys. She sold it out <laughs> like that. And, of course, and, it, and it's been on and on and on, and so it really it's just the idea of if you sell everything you've made, then you're not charging enough. I, I get that, but it's really often, more often than not, they just pick a number and see if you'll bite, and that's, again, not, not a good way to shop for wine. Um, la, uh, the next, next thing on the sheet, but uh, another big, uh, I think, mistake that a lot of people make when, it, when buying wines or trying to learn about wines even. Um, if you go to the, the vast majority of, of wine stores, not only in this town but in this country, have what we call in the industry shelf talkers. And this will be a little tag below the bottle and it says, you know, 89 points or 94 points from some clown somewhere that, said, you know, <laughs> and, and they have all these esoteric descriptors of and so you read that, and you're supposed to say, well, I think I like that, and then you buy it. The, uh, actually, this, this happened to me, uh, my girlfriend's birthday, uh, this past November. I'm not telling uh, tales out of school, but she, she likes an occasional gin and tonic. So I was going to go buy her a good bottle of gin. And being out of the bar and restaurant business for a little bit, I've sort of lost touch with the new, the new stuff that's come out. So I, I go to the Habersham Beverage on Habersham, and th these guys are friends of mine, so it's, and I don't think I'm talking trash on them, but I walk in, and it's 10.30 in the morning, and I, I look at, I'm looking at the, the, uh, the gins. Well, actually, by getting there, everything in the store has a shelf talker. I, I wouldn't wager if you went to the bathroom, the toilet paper probably has a shelf talker. <laughs> So I walk up to the, to the gins, and I see a few that I recognize, and I see a few that I haven't seen before. And I read the first card, and it says 94 points, again, from some clown somewhere. And it tastes like juniper and pine needles and blah, blah, blah. Okay, that sounds like gin. <laughs> and then I read the next one, and it says more or less the same thing. And I, I felt dumber after reading I felt like I knew less after reading both the cards than I did before I walked in. So I walked out. I went up the street to like uh, Kitchenware Outfitters and bought her some Le Creuset, which I thought she'd enjoy even better. <laughs> but again, points are, it is, it is unique to the, to the wine industry. I, I, I really don't know of any other industry that has allowed itself or, or even permitted it, not just allowed it. They've encouraged a, a, a select few people to ineffectively dictate what the rest of us get. I'm not saying it's a bad thing to have people's suggestions or recommendations or opinions about something, but again, they are simply opinions. Uh, now, what's happened is that basically most stores won't buy something unless a Robert Parker or a Spectator has given it its seal of approval. 